Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News on 3FM. My name is Beatrice Edu. The news is also live on Kesme 107.1 FM and across the world at 3news.com. Coming up in the next 30 minutes. Government under intense pressure to cause the electricity company of Ghana to release a load shedding timetable as the power cut worsens. Also, fresh push for the High Court to expeditiously hear case seeking to compel the President to accept the anti-LGBTQ bill for possible assent. Meanwhile, former Attorney General Betty Modi Driso hits at Godfrey Dame for advising the President wrongly on the anti-LGBTQ bill. Yeah, I, as Attorney General, I differed several times with what even the Supreme Court We'll bring you an exclusive interview and later, broken down vehicles left on the highways still a major problem. More than seven years since government suspended the mandatory towing policy with a promise to find a more sustainable solution. Thank you very much for joining us. Now pressure is mounting on the government to compel the electricity company of Ghana to publish a load shedding timetable as the erratic supply of power continues to hit homes, industries and hospitals. Many areas, even as of this afternoon, are without electricity, while the grimmest impact of the ongoing challenge already seen at the Tema General Hospital in the, 40, uh, in the last 48 hours. Even as uh, the business community and sector plan as demand is scheduled to plan live, government insists there will be no timetable. A cross-section of Ghanaians here in Accra have been back in calls for a timetable to be released. It's good for the government to bring timetable for the do so because none of us know anything about it. You can be in the house, and you'll be sweating in the house whilst we have children in the house too. It's too painful. By now, it's supposed to bring it out. I live at Alajo. Last night, I was sleeping around 12 midnight. The light went off. It came in around 3 a.m., brother. I think, yes, we need a timetable. I think it can help to ease the pressure of the current do so, do so. Timetable, they will have a do so, and they will have a so no more do more light, you know. No question, my name. On the do more light, they say, fifty an up at 7 o'clock. If you do 10, no more so. If you do 12, no more so, do more light, you say, no, you don't want. There's a three, four, no master. Until yes, I and yet, and Crophon, your man, so yeah, your man, so say it's obvious that the do so is there, and so I think it will be okay for us to give us a center because they can't tell us that there's no do so. Was every day we sleep in the darkness, so it will be better to give us a center table. You heard that a cross-section of Ghanaians, well, a former director of the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, Nanaya Jantwa, is urging the regulatory body to crack the whip. She maintains that ECG is refusing to release the timetable for purely political reasons. PURC, according to law, should punish them because there is, there is a punishment attached to an order that is flouted. When, when I was in the PURC, I remember we actually uh, sent an order to the ECG and they flouted it and the MD was arrested. And it was through the intervention of the minister at the time, Honorable um, OTAJ, uh, that he intervened and the, he was released. And whatever order we gave him was um, complied with. So if they have really reneged on it and they haven't complied, then they should give them the necessary sanctions available, including a jail term, um, a police can arrest them, they can be taken to court to be prosecuted and all that. But what, in your estimation, could really be the challenge as to why it is becoming so difficult for the electricity company of Ghana to comply with an order as simply as a load shedding timetable? It is political. It is not ECG per se because... Um, the government doesn't want a low shedding schedule to come out because they used um, doom so as a political tool to come to power. 
and now it has come to meet them. I remember when I was in PRC, I always said that no person should use electricity or energy issues as a political tool because you don't know when it will catch you. But now it has come to catch up with them. And because of the politics of it, they don't want to what, bring out the timetable. But a timetable will be good. You had a former director of the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, Nanaya Jantwa. Uh, well, one man who has been taxed to supervise the power sector, Dr. Matthew Pokuprempe, has been heavily criticized in the past week for urging those calling for a load shedding timetable to release one on their own. Well, listen to him when the MPP was in opposition and his recent comment. This demonstration is not to topple the government. This demonstration is to indicate to Ghanaians the insensitivity of Obama's government. The insensitivity of Obama's government. This is not to topple government. We don't advocate for a regime change this way. We are going to vote next year and we are going to vote them out massively. That is good governance. That is partisanship. I promise you that we are going to work on it. And it's not a work that is a single event. It's a process. And we'll continue to work on it for the energy sector to become better. Have you heard of calls for a timetable? Ask those who want yes. to bring it. They should bring the timetable. If there, if there is, I, have, I haven't seen any timetable. So but my people are calling for it. If bring a timetable, what do you mean? You heard the Energy Minister, Dr. Matthew Pokupempe. While uh, Dr. Matthew Pokupempe comes under pressure over the recent power outages and his subsequent comment over the lack of a load shedding timetable, the Importers and Exporters Association uh, has also been prompted to demand for his resignation. He should rather resign on Rowley uh, to go and continue to lobby for, to become his running mate and allow the president of the Republic of Ghana to appoint a substantive uh, energy minister uh, who would come and have a 100% full intention, uh, mind and energy towards working to restore the energy crisis back. Uh, we expect at this point in time we should have a minister uh, who will not wake up in the morning and thinking about running mate and also thinking about how to fix the power or the energy sector for us. I strongly believe that at this point in time we do not want to have a minister who have a divided attention, divided mind. At this point in time with this crisis, with this doom so, um, our current energy minister mind is divided, his attention is divided. He has two interests. He has an interest of, of being Phil Carroll himself as the energy minister and has an interest of him being being considered as the running mate for the new patriotic presidential candidate uh, for the 2024 election. I want to say the president, the minister should resign honorably or we will rally people to go and demonstrate, business community to demonstrate uh, for the president to remove him and appoint a substantive minister. Mr. President, I am calling on you to fire your energy minister immediately because he has two interests. You have the Executive Secretary of the Association of Importers and Exporters, uh, Samson Asaki Awin Gobert. Uh, South Dine MP uh, Roxin Nelson Dafiamakpo is urging on a car high court to have an expedited hearing in the case seeking to compel President Akufuado to accept the anti-LGBTQ bill and possibly assent to it. One month after Ghana's parliament passed the controversial bill, there is no clear idea on when it will become law, leaving promoters of the bill worried. Let's walk you through the journey so far. On the 9th of July 2021, there was formal process of legislation uh, with Gazette uh, notification for this very bill. On the 28th of February 2024, Parliament passed the Human Sexual Rights and Family Values Bill. On the 4th of March 2024, the president announced his inability to assent to the bill. The next day, which was the 5th of March, Richard Delasky filed a case at the Supreme Court to halt the pres uh, presidential assent. On the 20th of March, the Speaker of Parliament announced that Parliament was unable to consider ministerial nominees due to a pending case. 25th of March, the case was filed in court to compel President Akufuado to accept the bill. Uh, two days later, 27th of March, uh, the Supreme Court dismissed injunction application against vetting of ministerial nominees. I'm talking about just yesterday. On that same day, yesterday, the High Court urged, uh, was urged to have an expedited hearing in the case pushing for the President to accept the bill. 
We can listen to uh, Roxy Nelson, Dafia Mekos Council, Nick Pakos Samuado on a mandamus application seeking to compel the president to assent to the controversial bill. We have a mandamus application on the aid relative to whether the president uh, can be compelled to receive the process from parliament. And that is our focus as of now. The court says it will hear the substantive matter and the Supreme Court later. So when the, they serve us in the hearing notice, we'll go and deal with it. You say that the you, you have a mandamus which you are going to pursue after this? Yes, yes, yes. Definitely, the high court. Uh, uh, mandamus coming up, we are, we are pursuing vigorous, and uh, that for us is, is our next focus. That you are going to compel the president? Yes, that's what we are seeking to compel him to send uh, to receive the bill from parliament. The anti LGBTQ plus bill. Yes. Nick Pakpo Samado is a lawyer for uh, Roxy Nelson Dafia Mekpo, uh, speaking earlier to Alfredo Kansi. Meanwhile, former Attorney General and leading member of the position in D.C., Betty Modi Drusu has hit hard at the Attorney General Goffred Dame for advising the President wrongly on the anti-LGBTQI bill. Betty Modi Drusu says that the President's decision to bar Parliament from transmitting the bill was wrong. This comes after back and forth on what both the legislature and the executive could have done on the next stage of the bill for it to become law. Listen to an exclusive interview Madam Modi Drisu granted me some minutes ago. And I, as Attorney General, I differed several times with what even the Supreme Court itself thought was a legal interpretation of an issue. That's the opinion of the Attorney General. He is clearly wrong, but that's his opinion. He's entitled to it. So if you were in his position, you would have told the Oh, president. my dear, I'm not in his position now. I would do so many things different if I were in his position like now. What? Not only about this, about everything, OK? I think each attorney general, as you've seen us, uh, we've done, you know, we each have our own way of doing things. But the interpretation of the law is fundamental. And you know, you don't sit there only as attorney general and then you spout out the law yourself. You are advised on several fronts. And um, the way a young Mr. Dame is going about it, it's as if he's the only one who is talking from the Attorney General's he, office. He's in actual in his uh, job. I don't know. It's up to him. <laughs> I know what I did in my job. I don't know if he's doing the same. Others think this fight between the legislature, seeming fight, and the executive rather strengthens our democracy. Do you think so? I think it's fantastic. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. And um, ideally speaking, we should be able to trust in the Supreme Court <laughs> to give us the way forward. However, now, we, we, anything that's coming before the Supreme Court, we hold our breath, you know, so... What do you think can be done to strengthen uh, the judiciary from where you sit? Because the, the, there seems to be issues, even with what you said, that you don't think uh, it's been handled well as it should have been. To strengthen the judiciary, the judiciary should keep on carrying out their core task of implementing judicial opinions in an unbiased in an unbiased manner that is all we are asking them looking at it strictly in accordance with the law and you heard the uh, former uh, Attorney General Betty Maud Idrisu in that interview earlier uh, with me. You're still here on the Midday News on 3FM. When we come back, we'll tell you more about what's happening uh, with the striking teachers as well as uh, some issues uh, coming from the northern region as regards the water situation. Stay with us. Gentlemen, get ready for the first Indian Cry International Arts and Craft Show in Ghana. Organized by the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, GEPA. This 10-day festival will be a celebration of functional arts and crafts, home decorations, jewelry and textiles, with export forums on the sidelines. Date 26th April to 5th May 2024. Venue, Papaye Recreational Center, Ibri. Time 10 a.m. each day. Get ready to immerse yourself in a world of creativity and culture surrounded by the breathtaking beauty of Ibri. To register as an exhibitor, kindly visit gepafairs.org or call plus 233 
234-470-6112 or plus 233-209556525. Edinkra International Arts and Crowd Show. See you there. Adama, <laughs> And you're still here on the Midday News on 3FM. Thank you for staying. Now, government has declined to negotiate with striking teachers due to their refusal to call off their week-long industrial action. The three pre-tertiary teacher unions, the Ghana National Association of Teachers, NART, National Association of Graduate Teachers, NAGRAT, and the Coalition of Concerned Teachers, Ghana, among others, are demanding improved conditions of service. Listen to the Director of Grievances and Negotiations at the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, Professor Charles Adabo, speaking to the media earlier. If indeed they are able to call up the strike, we are ever ready as a government team to meet them even today or tomorrow. Thank you very much. No, no, but were you disappointed with them not calling up the strike? Obviously, um, you were there yesterday. Indeed, NLC is um, a state in institution mandated to do, do such engagement. And therefore, if they have given the directive that um, call up the strike so that negotiations can also continue and teacher unions not obliging, I think that clearly is something that is surprising to us. And uh, that was uh, the uh, a rep at the National, uh, the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. And the National Labour Commission on March 26 directed uh, government led by the Minister of Education, Dr. Yao Pukwe Ose Aduchum, to within two months distribute the teachers' laptops to them. Uh, Daniel Opoku is our Labour correspondent and he's been following the story. He joins us live on the line. Uh, Daniel, do we know what is preventing the teacher unions from calling? of the strike as directed by the NLC. Okay, we seem to have lost uh, Daniel Opoku on the line there, but you're still here on the Midday News on 3FM. My name is Beatrice Edu, and uh, we are talking about the strike uh, by the teacher unions uh, across the country, the pre-tertiary teacher unions, and the fact that it seems the government is not willing to have any negotiation with these uh, teachers until they have decided to call off uh, their strike. And uh, there is an update on this. We'll be bringing you that update uh, very shortly. You're still here on the Midday News on 3FM. Just to stay with us. So here are the Medanis on 3FM. Let's move to the northern part of the country, uh, precisely to the northern region. And the Ghana Water Company Limited has made an improvement in its water supply to some communities within the greater Tamale metropolis and its environs. Communities that did not get water flowing through their taps for over a year now have been supplied with water. The water distribution company in February this year assured residents that it was... Uh, working on some of its lines to improve 
water supply uh, to that uh, region and indeed to communities in that region. And we do know that in recent times, uh, residents have been agitating, uh, asking the water company to provide them with portable water, uh, which they haven't had flow through their taps for some time. And we're just hearing that the water company is now working or has actually improved uh, supply to uh, the Greater Tamale Metropolis and its environs. And I'm joined by Christopher Amako. He's a man in that part of the country. Chris, if you can hear us, this must be some good news uh, for the people of Tamale and its environs. Give us details. Yes, so uh, Beatrice, yes, definitely is good news for the people within the greater Tamale metropolis, especially the people of Kuku, Russia, Bangalore, and other areas that hitherto did not get uh, water flowing through their taps. As we speak, uh, most of the communities, affected communities now have water flowing through their taps, and they are very happy. Okay, uh, I know that you've also been speaking to the regional chief manager. What more has he been telling you as regards how they were able to get here? Yes, so uh, the managing director uh, uh, earlier this year in February toured some areas in the region. He, he visited Tamale, Yendi, Salaga, Damango, and all these places. He gave the assurance that they were going to ensure that uh, they get some uh, level of water supply to the residents because the uh, bigger project they were waiting for uh, to commence due to the uh, country joining the IMF program, they are unable to secure the loan facility for it. So uh, they were going to put in measures to ensure that uh, uh, water is supplied to the people. And so uh, because of that, they started some repair works. And for the regional uh, manager, this has come at a time that um, uh, they've been able to do uh, some major repair works and uh, pumping water to the affected communities. Let's take a listen to what he's been saying. My MD came here um, and told us about two weeks ago, um, we have refurbished our KY reservoir and made it a place now after more than eight years. So now we're able to hold water in our QR reservoir. We are also made operations very flexible with the bypass. So like you can see, now water can easily get from QI and get to Baga Baga. So as I speak to you now, Kuku, people are getting water right now. Those people have not gotten water over one year. And because of the intervention that we have put in, Kuku are getting water right now. And we have plans to serve target people after Kuku. So the interventions that we put in place are yielding the needed results. So the tension in Tamale is slowly calming down. But the fittings alone is 5.8 million Ghana cities. That's the lesson we have made to restore the operations of the KY reservoir. As for um, the water shortage in Tamale, it started years ago. In fact, it, it, it's, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's a history. You had uh, uh, the Northern Regional Manager of the Ghana Water Company Limited, uh, Christopher Amako, is still on the line with us. Just to wrap up our conversation very briefly, Chris, uh, what is the company saying about the other communities that are uh, yet to receive water flow through their taps? Yes, so uh, they have uh, instituted some mechanisms, uh, rationing mechanisms to get water to target, within targets and other uh, areas that uh, do not also get uh, water. As it stands now, they are doing some exercise to ensure that those who have inline pumps that uh, affect the free flow of water. They are, they are, the inland pumps are taken and they are made to face the full rigors the law. So for the Ghana Water Company, uh, they are hopeful that uh, in the next coming days, every area in the greater Tamale metropolis will get access to water. Thank you very much. Christopher Amako is a man in the northern region. Now, seven years ago, a move was made to find an effective mechanism to clear breakdown vehicles on major roads to reduce the spate of road crashes. This was to provide reliable towing services such that when vehicles break down, they would be swiftly towed to prevent crashes into stationary vehicles. Some reviews uh, were made to the Road Traffic Regulations 2012 
LI2180, in which the cost of towing vehicles was to be calculated and surcharged on the owner. Owners of breakdown vehicles were to report to the nearest police station or authorize the towing, uh, a towing service provider within at most two hours for their disabled vehicles to be towed. But broken down vehicles left on the highways remain a major problem, causing avoidable road carnages and taking people's lives. Over seven years, the country has failed in its attempt to implement a vehicle towing levy. With a pitch of darkness on major roads in the night, coupled with a lack of road markings, motorists are exposed to unending dangers posed by stationary vehicles. Christian Yale has joined us uh, on the phone with some more on this. Chris, I know you've been monitoring the situation in the past days. Which areas have you visited and what can you report? So I have looked at the M4 uh, from the Tetepache run about all the way through Madina to Adventa and in the night it is very chaotic. Right now I can speak to you, I am on the Pukwase in Sawam Street where there is a road construction ongoing and that has even doubled the problem on that street because you have heavy duty trucks, tipper trucks, minibuses, taxis and what have you that are grounded on the road some in the median of the road, some on the edges of the road. And the problem is even, even is that there are lots of these vehicles that do not even have the hazards on or the triangles or the attached gated on to show or to tell the oncoming car or driver that the car is stationary. And so it is a problem that is dotted across the capital in the night because a lot of street lights and traffic lights do not work. And even the problem about staged road markings also, it has, all of these have really compounded the problem. And it is a very worrying situation across the capital itself. This morning, for instance, a number of cars were, you know, broken down just in front of the Jubilee House. And we were even able to capture it by the intervention of some soldiers around. A towing car was brought in to, you know, clear the road and to remove all those cars. And so that is the, you know, problem we have right now on our major road network. Problem we have, you say, but uh, Chris, we know that we have some laws uh, that offer some amount of, so, or some solutions, as it were. What can you tell us about those? Yes, yeah, so uh, this is, you earlier mentioned the uh, road traffic regulations uh, 102 LI 2180, which says, I mean, and these were part of the changes that were made towards the revised towing system. And so it said, for instance, that an owner of a vehicle or person in charge of a motorcycle or trailer who causes or permits the motorcycle or trailer which breaks down on the road to be left on the road shall give notice to the nearest police station or authorize the towing service provider within an hour if the broken down vehicle or trailer is located within a built-up area. And within two hours, if the broken down vehicle or trailer is within a place other than a built-up area. This was Regulation 102 Clause 1 of that airline. But you would understand and you would even bear with me that the maximum of two hours stated in that provision is not even adhered to. A lot of vehicles break down on the road and it takes weeks or more for them to be removed from the road. The Road Traffic Act 2004 Act 683, for instance, mentions the fact that if a person leaves their car on the road for such days, they would be left on a family conviction to a fine of not more than 250 penalty units or to a term of imprisonment of not less than 12 months or both. That is section 21 of that act. Uh, Christian Yale, thank you so much uh, for that comprehensive report. We'll have to bring you uh, later, uh, more later, but thank you, Christopher, for bringing us uh, those details. Let's return to our story about the teachers' uh, strike. Daniel Opoku is our labor correspondent. He joins us live in the studio. Daniel, uh, let me first find out from you what you know is preventing the teacher unions from calling off the strike because it looks like the government wants to negotiate after that strike is called off.
Right, really. So when you look at the position of the industrial labor as says five for one, it basically says that you cannot be on strike while just negotiating. So the position of government is that the labor unions must call off their strike, and that has earlier been the position of the National Labor Commission, that the teacher unions must call off their strike. But as we speak now, they are still on strike. So until the teacher unions are able to call off, that's when government will be able to meet them. But when we speak to the teacher unions, what they are saying is that they are still speaking to their councils. Nagra has its council, NAT and CCT, they all have their council, they may have to consult. And and the indications we are picking is that they have been able to finish the consultations and hopefully by next week they are likely to call off the strike then education, academic work will resume okay that's wonderful thank you very much uh, daniel opoku for bringing us uh, that but uh, yes. before you go were there any other issues that came up that need uh, redress uh, before we go into uh, other stalemates really right the, 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 another major issue that government must deal with or stakeholders must consider is the fact that um, the forum what about the forum we're talking about about eight to 12 labor unions where they have been talking about second tier pension scheme they issued a statement two weeks ago it has expired they are still discussing and from next week we are likely to see something on the labor front thank you very much uh daniel opoku he's a man on the labor front And that's how we end the news here on 3FM. Our top story is government under intense pressure to cause the electricity company of Ghana to release a load shedding timetable as the power cuts worsen. Meanwhile, uh, there's fresh push uh, for High Court to expeditiously hear case seeking to compel the president to accept the anti-LGBTQ bill for possible assent. We brought you an exclusive interview with uh, former Attorney General Betty Mood Idrisu. My name is Beatrice Sedu. Thank you very much for joining us today. Log on to 3news.com for more news. Coming up next is Business Daily. Hello, good afternoon. This is Business Daily on 3FM 92.7. And line up this afternoon, fuel prices projected to increase again before end of March. We are going to hear from a petroleum expert at the Institute for Energy Security. Also, newly appointed Commissioner General of Ghana Revenue Authority, Julie Esiam, urged to address concerns of harassment meted by GRE officials. We'll hear from President of Guta. Plus, economist Professor Godfrey Bokwin calls for complete reform of Ghana's tax regime. Economy are you building and for who? This is not taxation, this is robbery. This is state sponsored robbery. My name is Minu Afo. We have details of these stories and more lined up for you. Stay with me. Thank you for your time. Now in our first story, the Institute for Energy Security is projecting an increase in fuel prices again this month of March. Adam Yakubu is a research policy analyst with the IES and he joins us on telephone for more. Good afternoon, Mr. Yakubu. Can you please tell us more about this expected price increase?
Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you so much, Mr. Yakubu, for joining us. I was asking if you could tell us more about the expected price increase in fuel prices. Yes, uh, good, uh, good afternoon to you and good afternoon to your listeners. Um, what we are seeing currently is as a result of uh, the depreciation of the gas city, which is the main driving factor in this particular uh, hike we are seeing. Because when you look at the numbers, uh, the world fuel market, you would see that refined petroleum products, petrol and diesel prices, even though it went up, we would have expected that the Ghana city's performance would offset the marginal uh, increments we saw in the world force market. Unfortunately, the city has done another depreciation after previous ones, mm -hmm. losing some 2.2% of its value against the United States dollar. Mm -hmm. So if you have prices on the international market going up and the city is also depreciating alongside, definitely the city is going to further pull the prices of uh, petroleum products on the domestic market upwards as we are likely to see in the coming days. And we are projecting that we could see prices inch up by up to 3% for the liquid fuel. LPG, however, might not see its price go up because the prices of LPG went down on the world fuel market and the margin of decrease is a little higher than what the city depreciation we saw, so it might not necessarily have a change or an effect on the on on the price of LPG. But for petrol and diesel, we are expecting that prices will go up by some three percent in the country. Okay, Mr. Yakubu, thank you so much for your time. So as he said, we may not see some, um, you know, changes in the prices of LPG, but for petrol and fuel, expect some changes in the prices of the pumps in the coming days. Move on to our next story now. The Ghana Union of Traders Association, GUTA, is calling on newly appointed Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority to address what it describes as harassment by GRE officials. Julie Isiam was appointed by President Ekufuado after the Dr. Anthony Otingesi-led board of GRE was dissolved together with the sacking of its Commissioner General, Reverend Dr. Amishadai Uwusu Amwa. Speaking to three business presidents of GUTA, Dr. Joseph Obing urged Julie Isiam to ensure a friendly business environment at the ports. So I, I think with that regard, the new board should take um, a, a, a critical look at it because it's, it's not worry, it, it's not helping the business community. We have to do a business in uh, freedom and tranquility, and we uh, and we we should have the comfort to do a business rather than being um, harassed or intimidated. And so um, that, that issue should be looked at um, critically. Um, even though we were able to work up on it, you know, we had a lot of um, problems with GRE, the Abusoka issue, the Kumasi um, 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 traders um, going on demonstration, then Cape Coast and other areas or regarding the uh, the task forces and um, the invigilation and all that. All these things do not help um, the peace or the, the the comfort or the neighboring environment for businesses to thrive. And so they should take a critical look at this. You heard the voice of President of Ghana Union of Traders Association, Dr. Joseph Obing. Meanwhile, a tax consultant, Geoffrey Okansi, has called on the newly appointed Commissioner General, Julie Isiam, to ensure enhancements and continuation of some of the progressive policies introduced by the former Con Commissioner General. I, I look forward to seeing this new uh, Commissioner General bringing on board um, maybe some new things and then also accelerating pace with the whole old things that have been put in place. For example, the digitized platforms, the introduction of relationship officers, the, 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 the issues of them having to, you know, meet a few times. I mean, today we held the National Tax Forum, and I think um, if, if you asked me, I, I was expecting to see, um, you know, um, the Commissioner General present, but he had a few things to do, and the, the unfortunate thing to happen, but, you know, you, you always expect that you see the, the, the top brass, you know, I'm not looking down on anybody who attended, but I'm thinking that, you know, these are the things that the GRA must reform and look at. 
and take such opportunities that come their way and take advantage and meet with industry consistently and then identify the issues. Geoffrey Okanse is a tax consultant. Away from that, a professor of finance at University of Ghana Business School, Godfred Bookwin, is calling for a total reform of the Ghanaian tax regime. He asserts that the middle-income Ghanaians spend over 50% of their income as tax, which constitutes robbery. Professor Bopwin spoke at the second edition of National Tax Forum themed Enhancing Taxation in Ghana Joint Participation. The effective marginal tax rate that the average Ghanaian middle class pays is more than 55%. Tell me, who said, what economy are you building and for who? This is not taxation, this is robbery. This is state sponsored robbery until wealth is redistributed and the rest of the and don't think that the state exists for government to be happy and since independence the whole system we have designed is to make government comfortable at the expense of the citizens at the expense of businesses i think we should engage more and we should let the data speak and let's have a future that every Ghanaian can be happy of and it's never in the interest of anyone to think that when the majority are financially repressed, the privileged few will be safe. No, it's never, it's never the case. So let's reset. We need to generate more revenue, but let's look at the appropriate handles to use. We are tired. That was Professor of Finance at University of Ghana Business School, Godfred Bopin there. Just in accordance with Section 101, Subsection 1 of Bank of Ghana, of Banks and Specialized Deposit Taking Institutions Act 2016, Act 930, the Central Bank has now appointed Dr. Joseph O. Franz as an advisor to advise the management of Universal Mer Merchants Bank Limited effective 25th March 2024. Now, that's the news we just called. We'll bring you details of that in our subsequent bulletin, but that's how we wrap up Business Daily here on 3FM 92.7. My name is Menu Afo. Do stay tuned. Black Star will join you for Urban Blend.